Welcome to the Crystal Coach Show with me, your host, Anahata, helping you live every day with clarity, guidance, and practical wisdom. Are you feeling overwhelmed, anxious, maybe disconnected? Do you ever feel like you don't know how to live a life of peace and joy? I am Anahata Roach, the Crystal Coach, and during this show, we channel divine wisdom through stories of service, spirituality, and stones for self-care. The Crystal Coach Show leaves you with a feeling of connection and the clarity it takes towards becoming the best version of yourself as you hear from thought leaders and many others to help you ignite the crystalline nature of who you really are. Stay tuned. The Crystal Coach Show starts now. Welcome, welcome to the Crystal Coach Show. You know, we all have a voice inside of us that judges the self as not being enough, whether it's a lack of worthiness or education, skill, wealth, class, you name it. What if it is possible to control your inner critic and create healthy internal boundaries? On today's Crystal Coach Show, we're exploring the subject as well as how this subject as well as how to, how we can actually um, have how can there be actually seven good reasons to find to feel like an imposter. Oh, and today we're opening the phone line for our live show to field any questions you might have around the subject we're discussing. So you can call 1-800-930-2819 or go to transformationtalkradio.com and use the chat window to comment. My guest today is life coach and imposter syndrome expert, Allison Kinnear, who has struggled with her own limiting inner voice and found a way to navigate the mind's obstacle course. After holding managerial positions within the corporate culture, Allison now helps other women in corporate and leadership positions to find work arounds for their own self-sabotaging beliefs. Welcome, Allison. Thank you so much for having me, Anahata. Oh, I'm so, so thrilled to have you here. I know you've spent like the better part of 22 years helping thousands of folks navigate their vulnerabilities as parents, employees, and leaders, but you really got into the imposter syndrome stuff um, in the corporate world, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but now, in addition to your coaching clientele, you... You also work in, in the high stakes professional world with groups like Microsoft and Google to solve um, underlying issues surrounding vulnerability based leadership, as well mm -hmm. as frequently giving talks on decoding the imposter syndrome, effectively managing stress and building a culture of trust in the workplace. That's wow. Wow. Phew. All of that and mothering two of your own small humans. <laughs> That's a pretty <laughs> full life, right? Absolutely. Oh, oh goodness. <laughs> so first up, um, Allison, can you define imposter syndrome for our listeners? I mean, that is, what is it and what does it lead to? Absolutely. And thank you for that. It's so funny. I just oh, I put my little cheat sheet and I just lost hold of it. So oh. <laughs> Of course. I spent one of these mornings for me too. For me too. <laughs> I was just like, I just, I laughed and my headset fell off. <laughs> okay. We're so good. The first thing to know is that this was originally defined as a phenomenon, imposter phenomenon. And that was defined back in 1978. There were two researchers, Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes, and how they defined this, this phenomenon was an in internal experience of intellectual phoniness. So on the inside, your experience is that I'm not, I, I'm a fraud. I do not belong here. I am not qualified for this. If anyone finds out, then I'm out. Um, 
so that is there was this phenomenon that they were finding that even though these were objectively successful women they on the outside on the inside they were were feeling like maybe they didn't belong and and like a fraud and so the thing to know about imposter syndrome first of all it's not a syndrome I'm not sure where phenomenon got warped into syndrome. You'll I'll I'll say it because that's the terminology that we're familiar with. Mm -hmm. But it's not like there's anything wrong with you. It's not like that, you know, you're in the DSM. Um, it's not like it's a diagnosis of any kind, but it's rather a description of this phenomenon that that exists among particular populations. And we can we'll get into the seven good reasons why. Yeah. Um but the, where the internal experience is, uh, you know, when you experience success, you wind up feeling relief mm -hmm. that you weren't found out rather than joy. Oh, wow. Right. That's, that, that's a lot. That's a lot. And I'm yeah. sure that, I mean, I certainly can relate to that, you know, um, here I'm, I'm like coming on and having things kind of be a little wonky this morning and you know my headset coming off I mean I could say oh I'm I'm really not I don't belong here right I mean yeah. but instead I in my head I was like boy that was a sexy move <laughs> <laughs> but anyway um the the research that's out there I know there's there's a lot of research out there about mm -hmm. this phenomenon syndrome whatever you want to call it um what I know you've you've done a lot of research on this. So what findings have really kind of stood out for you as as important to understand and and why? Can you tell our listeners why? Yeah, so the 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 my go-to expert on imposter syndrome is Dr. Valerie Young. And she wrote this book called The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women. It's a really fantastic book and if you have any you know, if if any of your listeners want to dive deeper into imposter syndrome and how it shows up, mm -hmm. even if you you identify as a woman or not, it, it is a it's a phenomenal book um, that really gets into all the research about about this phenomenon. Um, I think some of the things that stand out to me is that uh, number one, it impacts over seventy percent of the population, the general population wow. of North America really yeah, really and you'll see why as we get into the seven good reasons but 70 percent. so first of all the thing that happens with imposter syndrome is that you, it's really easy to feel all alone like you're the only one um however it's chances are very likely it's impacting 70 percent of the people you work with and around that's incredible but, yeah that's yeah. it really doesn't like 70 percent. that's that's way over half, right? So that's, that's yeah. wild. Yeah. So that's one thing. The other thing to know is that, that stands out to me anyway, is that imposter syndrome, it's a perception problem, not a performance problem. Mm. I'm going to say that again. It's a perception problem, not a performance, not a performance problem. problem. So what happens is people will often go, oh, I need another training. I need another degree. I need to become a subject matter expert in this and then in that and then in this. And if I just know enough or maybe I perform well enough or maybe if I get that, you know, if it, what happens is people who um, suffer from this tend to become really high performers. and. It, and they tend to be promoted, even though they don't really uh, uh, necessarily, they're not exactly asking for it because their skill sets are growing in hopes that they will feel better on the inside. But it doesn't matter. The performance can, make, can escalate in such a way that the perception never catches up to. And so the key is really about shifting perception. Mm -hmm and and some other things but but a big part is shifting perception so that um you can you can really work at not feeling like a fraud well if i'm understanding you right when you're saying you know like the more training you get the more uh this fear or this feeling of not being enough or not fitting in uh, or being unqualified um kind of escalates so how can you get ahead of that perception how you know i mean does confidence have anything to do with it at all um i think confidence has is definitely a part of it so confidence really like it, some people will say oh if i just have my work 
it's my work should just speak for itself. Mm -hmm. You know, like the quality of my work should just speak for itself. How I feel about my work shouldn't matter, right? My confidence doesn't matter. But if if your confidence is rattled, chances are you're not going to lean in. You're not going to raise your hand for opportunities. You're going to doubt. You're going to self-ruminate so that you're going to be uh, spinning in your head, wasting a lot of energy, sleepless nights, 3 a.m. going, oh, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Shoulda, woulda, couldas. Oh, uh, yeah, yes. absolutely. And so, and this also impacts if you're lacking confidence, you may not apply for another job. You may mm. just say, go, no, nah, this is my career now. I guess I'm stuck here. Or you may not ask for that promotion because you don't think you're, you're worthy of it. So mm. confidence is not the side dish. It's actually the main dish. Oh, oh. and wow. that impacts our perception. The sweet spot of confidence is when you are, and this comes from a really great book called the confidence code by Caddy Kay and Claire Shipman. Um, it's right here. I can show it to you. Yeah. Um, and so the confidence code, what they talk about is that the sweet spot of confidence is when your confidence level is just slightly above your skill set, just slightly. You, and that means your perception of yourself is slightly above your performance of yourself. So, so it's not like a full blown ego trip, you know, like I, you know, I, I'm the best yeah. or I can do this or, you know, like I'm, I'm the, the number one expert or whatever, but, but a little bit more than, you know, yeah, I, I'm confident that if, even if I'm, I'm not quite up at the skill set bar that I can learn and I can get and I can grow and I can grow into whatever is challenges perform is in front of me. Right. That's right. Yeah. You trust in your ability to learn. You trust in your own resiliency. There was a great study by Hewlett Packard that studied uh, men and women who put themselves up for promotion and women tended to wait until they met a hundred percent of the criterion before they put their name in to be promoted for men, 60%. Mm. They waited until they had just a little over half of the criterion met before they put themselves up for promotion. And I see this all the time in my work, people not applying for jobs because they haven't met 100% of the criterion, not applying for promotion because they haven't hit 100% of the criterion. But, you know, you miss all the shots you don't take, right? Right. And, and women, we as women always seem to be more critical of ourselves than um, men, you know, we, we, okay. it's just, uh, the inner critic, as you were saying before, that's what gets triggered all that's the time. Correct. That's correct. Oh man. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to take a really quick break. Uh, but I just want to remind everybody that the phone line now is open at 1-800-932-2819. And when we come back, We'll talk about the seven good reasons to feel like an imposter. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Crystal Coach Show with me, Anna Hara, and my guest today is Allison Kinnear. We're talking about the imposter syndrome, quote unquote, and um, we took break. We're coming back to just kind of explore. Allison, please tell us how in the world there can be seven good reasons to feel like an imposter. <laughs> I don't get that. I love it. I love it. So this all comes from this amazing research and book by Dr. Valerie Young, Secret Thoughts of Successful Women. And she talks about how like Imposter syndrome doesn't happen in a vacuum. Like I said, it's not a syndrome. It's not something that you're diagnosed with or anything is wrong with you. It is rather a phenomenon that happens because of certain conditions. Mm -hmm. And those conditions create really good reasons for you to be maybe second guessing yourself or wondering if you don't belong. And a lot of things. So the thing to know is that of the seven, six of them have nothing to do with you. What? Yeah. So I'm going to break this down a little bit. We were okay. just talking about confidence. Mm -hmm. So the, one of the one of the good reasons that to feel like an imposter is if you are a student or you are learning. A lot of college students feel like an imposter because they they are confronted with the amount of things they don't know. Mm 
And I think about this for people, any person in a job that requires a lot of learning, especially in the beginning, you know, when you're just starting a job and you've got a fire hose of new information coming in your face and you're having to learn a lot of things, or maybe the nature of your job is where you have to learn a lot of things, then you're going to feel put back on your heels and wondering, am I the most qualified person for this? Is this really what what I should, should be? Who trusted me with the, this? <laughs> right? How did I get here? Right? How did I get here? Exactly. So that's, that's one thing to know is like, if you are learning, chances are you, you might feel, feel, feel like an imposter. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Another, I get that. I get, you get that. that. Yeah. Another reason is if you work alone, so many of us now work, um, even if it, I think about when you work alone, even over, uh, you may work on a team, but if you're working over zoom or teams or any of these kinds of, um, you're working from home, situation you can't necessarily walk out of a meeting and go did I how did I sound you know when I asked that question did I did I come across you know all that little chit chat that you do as you're coming and going into meetings right. where you can kind of sound check you can have a little sounding board to go how did that go over I feel bad that I kind of pushed this or you know you have somebody that you can do that with when we're working from home Maybe you can do that in a chat, but you, you're not necessarily going to schedule a meeting or say something like that. It, that's something that happens like in an in-person kind of point of view, you know, or well, in most, more spontaneous way. Yeah. You Absolutely. would have to, you would have to create the situation rather than it be organic. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And this also impacts solopreneurs, people like you and I who are working primarily alone or artists, anybody who's, who is working primarily alone is going to wonder, am I doing the right thing? Should I be here? I, uh, one of the things I say my, to my clients all the time is stop shooting on yourself, please. Yeah. It's really messy. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So that's, that's Second. number two. Mm -hmm. Number three is creativity demand. And so for a lot of people, this does not exactly, I've talked to people who have been doing the same job. It's very predictable. They've been doing it for 20 years. They, they have no more learning curve and they are like, what imposter? What is that a thing? But if you are in tech or in any kind of industry where you, you know, the arts, entrepreneurs, if you are in an industry where you have to create, where you have to create something that has never existed before, or you, or maybe it's existed before, but you've never done it, that creativity is also going to do the same thing that being a learner does, that maybe even working alone does, where you go, who am I to do this? And am I doing the right thing? And the self-doubt just flares right up and you, and you're wondering, am I a fraud? So anything that drives innovation, you're going to be creating and taking risks. But if you're in a position where you create stuff, wouldn't you be the kind of person that likes to do that work? Absolutely. It doesn't mean you don't like doing it, but the process of I, my, my best friend's mom is an artist and, you know, the process of creating art is not only technical and not only you know, allowing that the beauty of creativity to come through, mm -hmm. but there's an, the inner critic can really flare up. I think Liz Gilbert talks about that in her book. Um, what is that book? Uh, the fear book. Um, oh my gosh, big magic, big magic. Elizabeth Gilbert talks about when you are creating something, when you are, when you are doing any kind of creative endeavor, fear it gets in the car with you. <laughs> Yes, that's true. And it will stop you if you don't allow it in the car, but it's got to go in the back seat and it's not allowed to even touch the radio dial and it's not allowed <laughs> to tell you where to go. Right. So any kind of creative work, it's a joyful experience. It can be really wonderful, but fear comes along in it because you're risking something because you're putting something out there that hasn't been there before. Yeah. Okay. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. I love yeah. that the analogy. Fear, fear can come with you, but it gets in the back seat and can't touch the radio dial. 
and can't tell you how to get to where you're going. That's, That's right. And you need the confidence. That's where the confidence part comes in, right? Mm -hmm. The confidence to reach out to a friend if you're feeling alone, the confidence to trust in your ability to create, your confidence to trust in your ability to learn and be resilient. That's where confidence really kind of comes into play. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, those are three. I'm going to talk about three other things. And there was a really great article that came out a couple of years ago called Stop Telling Women They Have Imposter Syndrome. And it was in, Har yeah, it was in Harvard Business Review. And the two authors, I'm going to hopefully get their names right, Rushika Tol Tolshian and Jodi Ann Burry. They wrote a really great article and they pointed to our next three good reasons mm -hmm. where, so workplace culture, that's number four stranger in a strange land, and you represent your entire social group. So I'm going to break these down for you. So work culture feeds it. If you have a work culture that is um, cover your rear end, uh, blame, if you fail, blame somebody, don't take accountability, kind of those, all the qualities of a highly toxic workplace environment, you are going to doubt yourself more. And that fake it till you make it, I'm not a fan of that because for people who do have this imposter feeling, the more you fake it, the more you feel fake. Feel the fake. Yeah. That's absolutely. right. Absolutely. And you get higher and higher and you go, well, that's because I'm faking it. You're not really seeing how you're actually making it. Yeah. Oh, so I've, I've been, I've been in that corporate situation where, you know, something goes wrong and then immediately people, I mean, the, the search is on for who to blame. That's right. Immediately. Yep. You know, it's, it's like, don't, it's not even, let's try to fix this. You know, it, no, it's like, well, it's so-and-so's fault. If so-and-so hadn't done that, you That's know, right. That's and right. yeah, you, that promotes a culture of fear. Absolutely. 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 So the culture is, is one thing stranger in a strange land. We have to remember that, business so imposter syndrome happens typically in the workplace environment people mm -hmm. usually aren't going around feeling like an imposter maybe in their day-to-day -day experience like they're a fraud they feel this way typically in the workplace environment or in an academic environment and the reason why one of the reasons why is, is because those institutions were made for typically upper class white men. And so it wasn't made with women in mind. It wasn't made with um, people from different socioeconomic classes, any kind of marginalized identity that you may hold, hence 70% of the population feeling this way. <laughs> It's because 70% of the population are women, hold some kind of marginalized identity, and, and the institutions, we rub against it because it wasn't exactly made for us in mind. And if you are an immigrant, if you came, uh, immigrated from a different culture, you're also going to feel like, do I belong here? Right? Absolutely. So that that is another reason. And then... The another reason is that you represent your entire social group. It's very similarly felt. So if you are the only woman in the room, if you are the only person of color in the room, if you are the only marginalized identity of some kind in the room and you are representing your entire social group, you know, by being there, then that is going to um, impact that do I belong and those feelings of fraudulence. And that's why the stop telling women they have imposter syndrome, they really hit on these three issues. They're like, this is not a women's issue. This is a workplace culture. This is a um, privilege issue. This is a this is an issue that is uh, that is broader, that is societal. And so don't put the onus on women put the, like, remember that this is all happening in a context. And so, Again, but that's back, only part of the We come back story. to the, the fear thing about who, who to blame. You know, it's like, right. well, women just can't fit in or whatever. That's right. That's or, right. The, what all those people that, all the different segments you just named, I mean, that's, wow. Wow. So that all makes so those, much sense. Right. Because these are all these reasons that matter. And so, you know, you have to remember, so being a learner, working alone, creativity, 
your workplace culture being like this, these institutions were not made for me. I'm representing my entire social group. None of those have anything to do with the individual. Those are all things that are the nature of the work or the nature of the society or of the culture that you're in. The final reason are messages from childhood. Oh, and that's the only one that's really within you, right? That's right. Right. And so what do we the have? Emotional control programming. Over? Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And so that's another good reason. If you were raised where you were never good enough, it didn't matter if you got all A's, but you got one B plus and, you're, and everybody went nuts, or maybe everything you did was so great that you really didn't know when they were telling you the truth or not. There's a lot of messages that we adopt from childhood um, that tells us whether we belong, whether we're good enough, and whether we're, we're okay. So good. I mean, I, I just, when I was reading that, I was like, how can that be that, you know, imposter syndrome, why, why would it be that it would be good to feel that? Well, now I understand because it's really outside of us. It's just, you know, we're made to feel that because of other outside influences in the environment. And the only thing that we've got control over really are, are um, identifying these messages, these internal messages that tell us we're not good enough because that was what was put into us as at a very early age or, or something similar, or as you, or you said, you know, it's the, the, the eighties or nineties or the aughts, early aughts of, of giving everybody a, 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 an award, you know, That's right. so everybody gets an award. So I'm, I, you're taught that, oh, you're, you're terrific. You're great. You're, you know, when in fact you may just be ordinary or average, right? So it really mm -hmm. kind of messes you up um, That's when right. you get to be older. But uh, yeah, this is- it, it all depends on how you, what messages did you absorb about what success means, about what failure means, about mm. mistakes, all of those things that, that, that we absorb. And even though these, these, to me, it's like the conditions that create a perfect storm for imposter syndrome. A lot of people that I have met when I do my talks are like, I have seven of the seven, or I have six of the seven. It's no wonder I feel this way all the time. It's not necessarily saying it's a good thing. It's just saying that these are reasons why it exists. Right. And if you can identify those reasons, then you know which way to go with it. Right. You can, you can exactly. get support about your early childhood messages. If you're feeling alone and isolated, you can reach out more intentionally. Mm -hmm. You know, there are different things that you can do. If you are the only person representing, you know, your, your social group, then find some um, affinity groups that you can talk to that, you know, if you're the only woman in the group, then reach out to women's organizations that are there to support women in um, your particular business industry, people of color, all of those things. There's a lot of groups and a lot of support to the reason. One of the reasons why they exist is to help people create those internal boundaries so that they can stay on the healthy side and, and combat all those feelings of, I don't belong. I'm, I'm a fraud. Oh, wow. So good. Um, we're going to take another quick break. And when we come back, um, Allison is going to share with us about how you can, you know, start setting those internal boundaries and, you know, awareness is the first key, but how do you work to quiet the inner critic and put the inner critic in the back seat? So stay tuned, come back. This is the Crystal Coach Show with Anna Hara, and I'm speaking with Anna, Allison Crenier, and we'll, we'll be right back. Thanks. Welcome back to the Crystal Coach Show. Um, we're talking with Allison Kinnear about imposter syndrome, and she just listed the seven good reasons why one would feel like an imposter, um, and it has to do mostly with the environment around you, uh, and the only one that that you personally have um, responsibility for is the emotional programmings and the messages that were given to you as a child around success and um, who you are, right? So in this segment, we're going to be talking about um, setting internal boundaries so that that inner critic can, 
knows its place, right? The inner critic is um, redirected in in more positive ways. And and as Allison said earlier, we're, we're going to put the inner critic in the back seat. They can't touch the radio dial or tell us how to how to get to where we're going. So, um, Allison, you developed a presentation I know around internal uh, boundaries. So you know that we we do set internal boundaries with ourselves, or we can. But sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But would you give us some highlights of of that, you know, this whole concept of internal boundaries, as well as some ways that our listeners can create healthy boundaries with their own critics, their own inner yeah. critics? Yeah, for sure. So one of the things that I, I, um, I was trying to put together this presentation, it was actually for a TED Talk, and then the TED Talk fell through. But in a TED Talk, but you, you know, you're- yeah, I have it. It's ready to go. It's ready to go. So one and of the that things, deck. that's right. Yeah. You know, it says like, what's the idea? What's, what is it that you do? What is it that you bring? And I, I had to sit there and go, what is it that I bring? Because I'm like helping somebody get out of an emotionally abusive relationship over here. And then I'm helping somebody become a first time manager over here. And mm-hmm. then I'm supporting someone in work-life balance and managing stress over here. And I'm like, are any of these things related? Mm-hmm. How are they related? And I realized that so much of this work that I'm doing, what's underneath it all and imposter syndrome and what's underneath all of it is trying to create a, a, the mental, a healthy internal world. And in order to create an internal world that can be of optimal health for any individual, we have to set some, some boundaries with ourselves. And most of the time we think about boundaries that we set with other people or with other things. And that's really just protecting your peace, right? Or showing the world how you want to be treated. Those are ways that we do boundaries with the external world. Mm -hmm. But part of that I think applies to our inner world, particularly the inner critic and the inner critic can run rampant. It's not that we're never going to get rid of the the inner critic. I think it's actually important that it's still kind of, it's, I, I don't know if it's important that it exists, but it is part of the reality that the inner critic exists. The question is, are they the one driving the bus? Are they the one at the steering wheel fig- t- deciding where you go? Or and a the lot control of tower. That's right. That's Definitely right. And a lot of people, control tower. they don't even realize it's happening. Mm-hmm. They don't realize how much that inner critic is a loud, noisy presence in their mm-hmm. mind. Yeah. When they're right, shooting right. on themselves, yeah. mm-hmm. that's right. Exactly. When they're saying, oh, you shouldn't have done that. You should have said this. You shouldn't have said that. Mm-hmm. When they're going, gosh, that was stupid. Or, oh, I can't believe you said that. You made that mistake. You're probably going to get fired. <laughs> All of those that internal dialogue. Oh, I got my performance review. Yeah. Yeah. People are being nice. You skip over all the positive things. And then it goes, you know where we're going? We're going straight for those three sentences of areas of development. We're going to hyper-focus and fixate and ruminate on that all night long. That's the inner critic. The inner critic is the one that takes that, all of that over, hijacks your system and only focuses on the negative. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, know the inner critic all too well. That's right. But it's good that you know the inner critic, right? It's like, mm. because that means you are aware that that's not actually you. That is a part of you. Right. And it's fear-based. That's you right. You know, when you listen for thoughts in your head and you go, what, wait a minute, is that coming from a place of fear? Right. That's a hundred percent. That's ego. That's the inner critic. hundred percent. That's right. And so being aware, building awareness of that voice in your head Mm. becomes really important. And I love one of my favorite activities that I do is where I love to give the inner critic a name. I love to give it like a persona, a personality, like to be playful with it, really Mm. to just let your imagination be playful. And I've heard, I've given my talk, Overcoming Imposter Syndrome to thousands and thousands of people, Amazon, Google, Dell, uh, so many uh, small organizations, large organizations. And I love hearing back people's ideas of what their, what their inner critic looks like, sounds like. And so for them, it can be like, oh, you know, it's, it's this person named Marge and she's just, 
super good. Sorry to all the marches out there. She's just like really mean and really like kind of rude and her desk is a mess and, you know, and everything I do is just wrong. For me, it's a, for me, it's not like a person. It's, it's a big wagging finger mm. that's shaming me. Mm. And I know it, my should, when I'm shooting myself, that is my indicator that my inner critic is active because it's saying you should have done this. You shouldn't have done that. Anytime I feel like somebody's wagging a finger at me, telling me that I should be ashamed of myself or I should be doing something. I know my inner critic's active and and now I'm like, oh, hi, hi, inner critic. Good to see you. Oh, or, or the little old ladies at church, you know, when you were growing up and the ones that sat in judgment of you all the time That's and right. always wag their fingers at you. That's funny. That's yeah. funny. I don't and know. When it's, Go ahead. When it's funny, then you can interact with it. Right. When right. it's not funny, it's fearful mm -hmm. and you kind of can't even stand to look at it right right but it, i mean again recognizing that it's coming from a place of fear then you can um say well then you don't have any power over me that's right you know you're not the boss of me that's right right uh did i ever tell you about how i i created a throne room for my ego my inner critic no yeah i don't know how i got this idea but just one day um i just the monkey mind would not shut up and i'm like okay wait I know this is ego because the ego is created to, to tell the body I'm hungry. I'm sleepy. I'm thirsty. I'm, I hurt, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, so it's like, it's domain. It's, it's, it's the sovereign over the body. Right. So yeah. that just kind of came to me and I was like, okay, I'm going to make, I don't know why it's over here in the spleen area, but I'm going to make a throne room and I am like pimping it out big time, making it all this gold and, and the fine diamonds and jewelry and rubies and emeralds. And I mean, everything, right? Everything. And so I, tr I really did. I mean, ermine on this gold throne, everything, red carpets, I went up into the control room in my mind and I saw that she was up there. Right. And I said, Hey, I got something I want to show you. And she's looking at me like, Oh, I I'm busy. I'm like, no, 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 you, you need to come here. Come here. And I got her to go down in the throne room that I just made. And she walked around and looked around and I knew I had her when she like caressed the throne, just kind of caressed it, the, the arm of it. And I said, go ahead, sit down. And so I, I saw her just like sit down. And my mind went quiet, completely still for the first time in my life. I swear to you on my grave. It, um, it was unbelievable. I love this so much because <laughs> oftentimes people go, how do I get rid of the inner critic? And they try to punch back. They're trying to knock their inner critic out. And guess what? You will always lose that battle. And if anything, you make it stronger. And so the idea is not to knock it out. The idea is actually to befriend it. The mm -hmm. idea is to welcome it in, but put it where it needs to be. Right. Be in the back seat. Make the back seat your throne room. Make it right. fancy. Make it honoring because it does serve a role. It does right. serve a purpose, but it does need to go in in its own place in its own place it's like I, right. I told her i said you are your your job is to reign over the body and and i'm very grateful for you Love to it. do that but i you know you can't do my job and yours so here's the throne room here's it and and reign over the body and every once in a while she gets back up there and i'm like um you kind of need to go back down to the <laughs> throne room place <laughs> I love that so much. Really. Oh, uh, well, really I'm sorry to, to to pull you off your topic, but I, I just No, I you were like right was... on topic because that is exactly where the inner critic belongs. The inner critic belongs in the throne room with all the beauty and all the jewels and all the gems because that's what's enticing for the inner critic. They yeah. want to feel honored. So yeah. I love that so much. <laughs> As I say, I don't know where that came from. It was a kind of a divine um, inspiration, I suppose. I love it. Uh, so um, can, I, I, when we were talking earlier, you were talking to me about this bumper sticker that you saw that you thought was so cool. 
and and you said, oh, remind me to tell about the bumper sticker story. It, we, so, you would just, so it dovetails. <laughs> it dovetails a little bit on this. So the the. <laughs> I had a therapist, really wonderful therapist. I, I am a big uh, proponent of high quality therapy, which is hard to find. You can find therapy, but you can't always find high quality therapy. True that. And so, uh, but I had a really wonderful therapist and she had, on, I we would have these early morning sessions and her car would be the only car in the parking lot. So I knew it was hers. And she had this bumper sticker on her car that said, don't believe everything you think. Don't believe don't everything you think. Stop think. believing everything you think or don't believe everything. Don't believe everything you think. Okay. And I was so confused. For months, I would walk by that bumper sticker and think, well, who the hell, why do you not want to believe what you think? Shouldn't, isn't part of my work that I'm tr learning to trust myself and I'm learning to trust in my abilities and learning to believe myself? Like, why would I not want to believe everything I think? And what I came to realize was it was pointing to, we have many voices inside our heads. We have many parts of ourselves that show up and that shares their opinions. And we have to be mindful about which ones we choose to listen to, oh, absolutely. about which ones we choose to believe. Mm -hmm. And the inner critic is not the most reliable source when it comes to our abilities and um and, and and our sense of self and our sense of belonging no it has one tape it has one tape and that tape is never good enough who do you think you are you probably don't belong and that's the only thing it can say and if we loop. try and it's a loop and if we try to say no can't you say something else the inner critic can't mm -hmm. that's all it can say that's its only job is to say that the question is is there another part of you that we can listen to? Right. And, and how do we tune into that other part and kind of put the inner critic in balance, in checks and balance? Because to me, a, a part of imposter syndrome is where the inner critic has been running everything. It's overinflated. You don't even know at the end of the day, did I even accomplish anything? Mm -hmm. Do I have anything of worth? You sit down to do your performance review and you're like, I have, I, I have not done anything. I can't even remember what I'm good at. Can right. somebody tell me what I'm good at? Can somebody tell me what I accomplished? Because all I see are all the things I did not do, all the things I did not accomplish. I'm, all, I'm comparing myself to everybody else and I am coming up short. That is an indication that the inner critic is running wild. Yeah. So that needs to be put in check. Okay. And we have to develop the muscle that finds a truth that's bigger than the truth of the that the inner critic is trying to sell you on yeah okay so aside from uh don't believe everything you think what uh, what kind of key takeaway do you have for folks who hear the imposter the who hear this podcast and and they you want them to remember about imposter syndrome or is the bumper sticker it well the bumper sticker is great so just be mindful about not Don't believing believe in our critic. Think. Yeah. Be careful about what you choose to believe. And I think the other part of it really is, is to remember like inside of you is that sovereignty inside of you is a part of you that deeply, that, that, uh, that is your higher self that knows your worth, that knows your value. And it might be a whisper while the inner critic is a scream. Yeah. But there is a part of you that knows there's an inner hero inside of you. There is this part of you that has a deeper knowing that everything is okay, that you are okay. And that is the voice to tune into. And so something that you can do to like exercise that muscle is to, when you do get your performance reviews, when you do get a compliment from somebody, when you receive some kind of positivity is to receive it, receive, receive, receive. Because what happens is oftentimes we go, oh, it was nothing. Oh, it's fine. Oh, no big deal. Oh, no problem. Oh, you're just being nice. And we swat it away like flies. We even use our hands to swat away the compliments. And so part of the work becomes to receive it, yeah. receive the compliments. And at first 
I know for me, I felt like my skin was on fire and I wanted to run out of the room. And so what I would say to people is like, I would breathe and I would say, I would like Lama's breathe and go, they would pay me a compliment. I go, thank you. My therapist told me I need to work on receiving compliments. And so I'm going to say thank you to you. It was very uncomfortable. Oh. But that usually made people laugh and it was, and it helped me to be better at receiving. So we have to get better at receiving the positive. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's one thing. Yeah. That, oh, that sounds like pretty good, two good takeaways. Um, but for listeners who might want to learn more about working with you around coping with imposter syndrome or other issues, how do they find you, Allison? Do you, uh, yeah. do you have any new I'll programs coming up or anything? I do. I do. So alisonkinnear.com is where you can find everything that you want to know about me as a speaker, as a coach. Um, I am also uh, starting a new program. It will be launching October 10th of this year, 2023. Um, and it is designed to provide ongoing support around all things that imposter syndrome touches upon, um, boundaries, communication, work-life balance, managing stress, imposter syndrome, confidence. And it, the program is called Align. Um, it's about aligning your life, aligning your communication, aligning your worth, aligning your relationships. Um, the landing page is still in development at the moment, but you can still find all that you need to know um, about me at Allison Kinnear. I also send out a newsletter every Monday that goes into depth about all these issues. Um, and you can see all of my past uh uh, blogs and newsletter posts on my website. Um, and that's A L L I S O N K I N N E A R.com. Correct. Correct. We don't know lots of ways to spell Allison and a lot of ways to spell Kinnear. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Allison, thank you so much for being here today. It's been a fun and informative show. Um, as always, though, I'm I'm going to give us some stone recommendations um, and, uh, you know, this time for working to develop strong, healthy inner boundaries. Uh, I've got three today for you. Um, the first one is lapis lazuli. Lapis is this beautiful blue mm -hmm. stone that um, if it comes from Afghanistan, it's got some pyrite in it. So it has like some gold lead sparkles in it, but it's this deep blue, beautiful stone. And that's really to help you strengthen confidence in what you know, you know, okay. Instead of listening to the inner critic tell you, you're, you don't know enough. Um, the other one is addressing that whole emotional messages, you know, childhood messages thing. And this is called rhodochrosite. Rhodochrosite is this beautiful, jimmy pink um it looks like you can it looks like a piece of candy it's uh got like striations of white like uh, little lacy lines in it of white and it's pink um it's it's used for a lot of things but it's mostly in this instance you can use it to control anxiety um that would be stemming from the emotional programming and limiting beliefs around your your own abilities um, and last is a uh, very not common um, stone called sericite. Now, sericite is um, actually has lead in it, which is really interesting. So it's a very, very heavy stone. But it, it, the energies of sericite help us overcome preoccupation with perfection. Hey, hey. <laughs> uh, increases the brain processing activity and allows clearer thoughts and greater concentration. So it you'd have to hunt for this, sericite. It's C-E-U-R-I-S-S-I-T-E, -S -S -E, sericite. Um, you know, I, I, I was at a gym and mineral show yesterday and I didn't even think about looking for that. So I'd have another piece of it, but oh well. Um, so yeah, great show. Thank you so much, Allison. And um, again, everybody, uh, please reach out to Allison. She's a wonderful coach and a really wonderful human being. And uh, she knows her stuff. So, uh, and if you want to talk to me or work with me on emotional programming um, clearing, 
uh, that's my jam. Um, I'm at thecrystalcoach.com. So with that, thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time on The Crystal Coach Show. Bye for now. You have been listening to The Crystal Coach Show, helping you live every day with clarity, guidance, and practical wisdom. With me, your host, Anahata. Tune in every first and third Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time on TransformationTalkRadio.com, where we channel divine wisdom through stories of service, spirituality, and stones for self-care. Feel connected and reside in the vibration of love on The Crystal Coat Show. For more information and to become the best version of yourself, visit thecrystalcoach.com. That's thecrystalcoach.com. See you next time.